We're interviewing, this is Ron Campius with the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. I'm interviewing Dr. Philip Gordon, who was, uh, has been with the U.S. National Security Council as a special assistant to the president and the White House coordinator for the Middle East, since uh, and North Africa and the Gulf region, since March of 2013. Before that, he was the Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs uh, from uh, May of 2009. And uh, then before that, he was a Senior Foreign Policy Advisor to the 2008 presidential campaign of then Senator Barack Obama. And he was, uh, he, he served at the Brookings Institution, did time on the uh, National Security Council under Bill Clinton, and uh, was at the, a fellow at the International Institute of Strategic Studies in London. Thank you for coming, first of all. Thank you for being with us. Um, I wanted to start off with, uh, you, you, you said at the National Iranian American Council a couple of months ago, you anticipated that if, uh, if there is a deal in Iran, if, there, if, if this works out, the talks work out, that it could begin a multi-general process that could lead to a new relationship between our countries. And just now, yesterday, we had the uh, Ayatollah Khamenei outlining his nine-point plan for destroying Israel. So I, I wanted to ask you, I mean, is it conceivable that the Iranian theocracy, as it now exists, could have relations with the United States? Is that something you anticipate? So let me, let me first of all, it's uh, nice to be here and have a chance to exchange views with you on, uh, on a range of subjects. First, to clarify the quote, multi-generational, I believe, was right, the, yes. not general, but generational. Right. And let me just tell you what uh, the Iran negotiations are about and what they're not about. They are about finding a way to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon and to make sure that any nuclear program in Iran is exclusively peaceful because we think that an Iran with a nuclear weapon would be a tremendous threat to us, to Israel, uh, to the world, to the non-proliferation system. So these negotiations with Iran, which are going on as we speak, are solely focused on stopping Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. They're not about, so that's what they are about, they're not about transform the US, transforming the US relationship with Iran. They're not about uh, uh, accommodating Iran. They're not about overlooking Iran's destabilizing activities in the region or policies towards Israel or support for terrorism. And uh, so the reference to could begin a process, it is true that if Iran starts to become a more responsible actor by showing that it's willing to abide by Security Council resolutions, engage in a commitment with the international community, uh, and give up its nuclear weapons program, then we do believe it is the case that generations from now you could have a different Iran. But that's not what this is about, and it's not what we are seeking in these talks with Iran. The president said yesterday that there's a, a, there remains a gap. He didn't sound very optimistic about November 24th. What happens if on November 24th there's no agreement? Do we go to a, an extension? What happens? Uh, first thing is we are focused on a different scenario, which is getting it done. And the president did say there are big gaps. Uh, there are. We've been at this for uh, some time with the Iranians. And we will only accept an agreement that blocks all of the potential paths for Iran to get a nuclear weapon. So that means they can't go down the enrichment path, whether at Natanz or Fordo. It means they can't go down the plutonium path through their reactor at Iraq means they can't go down a covert path. We need more inspections, verification, and transparency. So we are uh, determined to make sure that uh, they have no way of getting towards uh, a nuclear weapon. So there are gaps because they are trying to preserve some things that we are simply not prepared to uh, accommodate. Uh, it is not, however, impossible to close those gaps. There is still time. Our negotiators are there. Frankly. Uh, nobody expected this would be easy and that Iran would make these concessions up front, but I dare say they know what they need to do, uh, and what we're focused on is getting it done before the, the 24th. Uh, anything after that dramatically reduces the chances for a deal, and if there's not a deal, then, uh, then there, there are big problems for everybody. 
So you return to zero, you start working with Congress to sanction Iran? Because certainly the new Congress is, is kind of itching to uh, yeah. sanction Iran. Well, first of all, we have already worked extensively with Congress to sanction Iran. That's why we think Iran has come back to the table. We have worked with Congress and with the international community to impose the most comprehensive international sanction structure that has ever existed that has really increased the cost to uh, Iran of uh, failing to abide by its commitments on this score, uh, really imposed a heavy price, and we think that's what got Iran back to the table. I do think it's important to stress in there, we worked with Congress and we worked with the international community because these sanctions only really became effective when the world got on board. The EU oil embargo, which you know a decade ago no one would have imagined uh, possible, uh, South Korea, Japan, China, India, by getting the whole world uh, on board, we've really put the pressure on Iran, and that gives us a shot to resolve this peacefully. So we're already working with, and I stress that because going forward, we have to keep that in mind as well. We don't want to do anything that will cost us that coalition. You, you mentioned sanctions and sanctions that should come from here or there. If we move unilaterally without the rest of the world, we won't succeed. You know, the United States itself didn't do business with Iran. We haven't traded with Iran, invested in Iran, dealt with Iran since the revolution. But when we were doing this alone, it didn't work. Right. So it, it is important to us to keep the world on board, as we have done. Uh, so we've worked with Congress, and absolutely we'll work with Congress moving forward, and we've told the Iranians that. If they don't uh, meet the reasonable standard that we and other countries have put, you know, the P5 plus one has really put offers on the table, that would provide assurance that the program is exclusively peaceful, but allows Iran to have a civil nuclear energy program once they meet the commitments of the international community. If, if they don't meet that, uh, those requirements, then we are confident, one, that our Congress will be ready to pass sanctions on day one, uh, and that we can keep the world with us. But that's what we're trying to do moving forward. And you forward. can specifically keep the world with you if the November 24th deadline is not met not just because Iran walks away or does something stupid, even just because the, the, uh, the deadline's not met, you, you have the world on your side. Well, so long as we are working with our partners and demonstrating that the problem here is that Iran is not willing to demonstrate the, the peaceful nature of its program, if we were to insist on things that our partners didn't agree with, we might have, might have a problem. I you know, won't take any examples, but you could imagine the United States coming up and saying, well, we insist on X, but the, the rest of the P5 plus one says, well, no, that's unreasonable. Then we might have a problem because we would say, all right, negotiation's over. We're walking away because Iran didn't uh, agree with us. But the others would say, well, hang on, if you had done something else reasonable, they would have. The good thing is, we're united with the P5 plus one right now because you know, they have the same standard as us. We're not asking for anything unreasonable. We're asking Iran to demonstrate that it's, you know, Iran says it has a peaceful nuclear program, that they don't want a nuclear weapon, that a nuclear weapon would be contrary to Islam. We say, okay, uh, we believe that, just demonstrate it to the world and these sanctions can gradually be suspended and then lifted. And so long as we do it that way together, we'll keep the international coalition united. And then if Iran walks away, then you'll not only get new U.S. sanctions from Congress, you will get continued international pressure, which is what has worked. So we do have to be careful in not going about it in a way that would cost us that coalition. The, uh, um, you, you mentioned that uh, you know, one of the things you have to ensure is, uh, is cutting off a pathway to uh, weapons level enrichment. There's a considerable difference between you and the uh, Israeli government, between your government and the Israeli government on, on what that means. The Israeli government does not want to see any enrichment capacity. They want to see the centrifuges destroyed. I'm not sure exactly where you are. I've heard of leaks about having the pipes dismantled, about all sorts of ways to keep enrichment down to 5%. Uh, how do you address that with Israel? And you know, the, the Iranians, you, you talk about inspections with inspections, with uh, two of the best spy agencies in the world, Israeli and United States, the, Israeli, the, the Iranians built this massive weapons, uh, not weapons, but enrichment facility in a, in a, in a mountain. And nobody noticed until 2009. How, how, do you, how do you ensure, how do you reassure the Israelis? Uh, a couple of things. First, I wouldn't overstate the differences. You say, you know, we have one view, Israel has a different view on blocking off enrichment. 
Actually, in a certain sense, we have the same view. Uh, we also would like to see Iran have no enrichment capacity, whatever. That uh, has been our position. It is our position now. The best outcome for, uh, of these talks, the best outcome on the Iranian nuclear program would them, for them to have zero centrifuges and zero enrichment capacity. Uh, we in Israel agree on that. We have taken the view that given that Iran already has a significant enrichment program, which it built up uh, over the years in multiple American administrations and Israeli administrations, uh, built up to a certain point, uh, has the 9,000 operating centrifuges that, is, has, that it has now and a certain stockpile of enriched uranium. We have taken the view that if we can get satisfaction on all of the other things that concern us, uh, which is to say uh, inspections and transparency, blocking off the plutonium path, uh, dealing with weaponization and possible military dimension, dealing with Security Council resolutions. Uh, if we can get confidence in all of those areas, we can imagine living in a world in which Iran has a small enrichment capacity uh, that is, is it possible to get con confidence when Iran has a small enrichment capacity? It has eight tons of, uh, of low-enriched uranium at its disposal right, right now. Uh, we'll find out in these talks if it's possible, but that's precisely my point. If we could get the stockpile down to a size where there was no risk that they could quickly use it to uh, build a nuclear weapon, and if the number and types of centrifuges were such that it would take them a long time, like a year at least, to develop enough uh, highly enriched uranium for a bomb, and if we, through inspections, could have confidence that they didn't have the capacity to turn it into a weapon and deliver it, the, uh, then that extended timeline would give us enough confidence that if we detected an attempt to break out, we would have plenty of time to deal with the problem. So again, would we rather they have zero centrifuges and zero enrichment capacity? Of course, that would be better. But what we don't want to do, and that's maybe an example of where I was saying we need to keep the world together. We could, in these talks, take the view that the only acceptable outcome to us is zero centrifuges. We could show up in Vienna or Amman, wherever it might be, and say zero centrifuges. But if the result of that was Iran saying, well, on that basis, no deal. Tomorrow we're going to not only uh, start again enriching at 20%, we're going to install the 10,000 centrifuges that weren't installed uh, before. We're going to restart the Iraq reactor. Then we would have the clock ticking towards a real uh, crisis, a real breakout capacity, and we would be reduced to very poor options, which would be letting them have a nuclear weapon, which we obviously aren't going to do, or using military force, which has all sorts of other consequences and would only set the program back a certain amount of time. That's why we have said, yes, we can imagine a small enrichment program, so long as uh, we had confidence that if they tried to break out, we would have plenty of time. Let's go to uh, the... And Israel that's the only sort of deal we'll accept. Let's go to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You had two terrorist killings today in Israel. Uh, a woman was killed in the Alon Shvut, and uh, a man, a soldier, was killed in, uh, in Tel Aviv. Both were stabbed to death. You have... Uh, unrest uh, among Israeli Arabs. According to video that's posted, a, uh, an Israeli Arab was shot by police while retreating, and that's tr tr triggered off riots. Uh, and then you have, like, John Kerry saying recently that he wants to renew peace talks in the, uh, in the, in the final two years, uh, but, but also saying that the sides have to want it. The sides really don't seem to want it right now. How do you, uh, what, uh, does the United States need to take a more proactive role? Well, look, we're obviously very concerned about the recent developments that you cite and have condemned the, uh, the violence and the attacks and the, the terrorism that we've seen in recent days. Uh, but I don't think that those tragic developments are inconsistent with your other point uh, about the American view of the need for peace and a peace process. Indeed, I think they go together, because what we've said consistently and what we argued throughout the past year, indeed, if we argued since the beginning of the administration, is that in the absence of an agreed negotiated peace process, the risk of violent attacks increases. 
Uh, and it is indeed the absence uh, of peace that uh, provides the context in which you see Well, does the U.S. Uh, take a more coercive role then? Does it come in well, with its plan? Uh, does it outline we, a, a we've final never, status? We've, coercive is not the word I, I would use. We've never believed that we can impose it, where we just come in. Some encourage us to do that from time to time. Just come in and tell the parties what they need to do. Uh, we don't think that works uh, either. So that's why we have tried what we believe is the only way forward, which is diplomacy and negotiations. That's why I put such an effort into it last year. Then too, there were plenty of people saying, it'll never work, the parties aren't ready for peace, you don't have partners. But while never being naive uh, about it, we, we knew all of the obstacles, we also have not seen a better answer. Uh, and you know, we see that before us today, where in the absence of peace, you see the sort of violence you refer to, you see the, the war in Gaza that so tragically uh, broke out and other perils no doubt lie ahead and we say it to our our friends in Israel and you know we ask it uh, as a question and we've asked it uh, all along both sides obviously need to compromise for there to be uh, an agreement but uh, if Israel is going to be the Jewish and democratic state uh, and stable and secure place that we want it to be we don't see the alternative to a negotiated solution with the Palestinians. Are you talking to the leaders? I mean, Mahmoud Abbas is, uh, is ratcheting up the rhetoric uh, regarding the Temple Mount. The, the PLO recently, quote-unquote, instructed the media not to refer to it as a Temple Mount, just one example. Benjamin Netanyahu said that uh, protesters, if they wanted, could move to the Palestinian area, areas. Are you communicating to the leaders that maybe they could ratchet down the rhetoric a little bit? Uh, we absolutely are. Secretary Kerry has been in close touch uh, with the leaderships. Our people on the ground have been talking to both sides, the Jordanians as well, obviously, given their uh, role uh, in urging uh, nonviolence, uh, urging a return to the status quo, urging all sides to avoid uh, provocations. We were encouraged by the recent uh, communications between the Israeli and Jordanian leadership that did just that and appealed for the Israeli Israeli and Palestinian leadership. I mean, uh, the Israeli and Palestinian leadership needs to communicate and, and urge calm as well. And we say it to both sides. Uh, people are playing with fire uh, and it will backfire and, and hurt everybody. Are Benjamin Netanyahu and Mahmoud Abbas playing with fire, do you think? Uh, I think uh, anyone who is not uh, urging uh, calm and nonviolence and a return to status quo uh, runs the risk that uh, that it could be a very explosive situation. Now you, you're, you have to you have to maintain a really you have a strong relationship with Israel uh, uh, on security. You just talked about two reasons you have to maintain strong diplomatic uh, relations with Israel, having to do with uh, uh, coordinating coordinating on Iran, the prospects of Israeli-Palestinian peace. Why on earth would somebody in your department in your building? use the epithet that I won't repeat here to describe the Prime Minister. What's going on? What's the culture inside the White House when it comes to dealing with uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu? Well, first on the comment and then the broader point. I think you know, Ron, we have been clear that, uh, that the comment that you refer, refer to uh, does not represent the view of the administration. Uh, it was an irresponsible comment. It was a counterproductive comment. Um, and, and so there's nothing more to say about it because there's it's, a it sequence doesn't reflect of comments. our view. I mean, there's like a whole bunch of comments that Jeffrey Goldberg outlined in his article. There seems to be a, a culture of this, and he seemed to have spoken to multiple people in the, in the administration. What, what is going on there? I mean, what I can tell you is that we work incredibly closely with the government of Israel. President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu, I, I don't know that there's a leader who's been more often in the Oval Office or more often on the telephone with the president. They have enormous strategic interests that they share. The president is deeply committed to the relationship with Israel. Our transparency with the government of Israel on all of the hard questions you and I have been talking about couldn't be more complete. Uh, the, at the very time when the remarks that re you refer to came out in the press, we were spending the day. Uh, I joined National Security Advisor Susan Rice for the U.S.-Israel consultative dialogue where we spent six or seven hours with a team uh, from Israel led by National Security Advisor Yossi Cohen, but also represented by senior leadership in the Israeli Ministry of Defense and Intelligence Community and Foreign Ministry, where we spent the entire day talking about 
regional issues, uh, sharing views on Iran and that particular challenge. So we were doing the work. We were working together as close, uh, trusting partners, while others were talking about relationships and politics and personalities. And, you know, that's fine. It's the nature of things. But just understand that, you know, we have real uh, uh, shared interests, shared values, shared strategic interests, and real business to do with the government of Israel, and we do it. Well, let me put it another way. How do you, uh, I mean, the, these, these leaks from both sides, uh, from an anonymous Israeli minister over the summer accusing Kerry of a strategic terrorist attack because of the, uh, uh, the ceasefire proposal, of Moshe Yaalon, and the things he said, how do you stop that from happening? What do you, what do you tell the Israelis? What, what, what do they need to be telling you to keep that from happening? Because it does damage the relationship. It does damage the relationship. And look, it's part of uh, the open societies that we have. Uh, and by the way, we don't agree on everything. And we've made that clear too. Uh, there, there's no secret we have differences on different... These are hard issues. We, we don't even agree within the United States, let alone between the United States and Israel. Uh, there are aspects of... Uh, 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 Israeli policy on some of the things we've discussed where we have a different view and we say so and we say so quite uh, directly and it's therefore not surprising that there are differences these again are terrifically hard issues both of our societies are full of people with a wide range of views that by the way call each other names domestically just as people call each other names across uh, but that's part of uh, that's part of politics and it's part of the tough world that we live in and you know I think the people who are maybe least phased by this are the leaders themselves uh, who uh, understand the political challenges that the other leader faces uh, and, the, and the responsibilities that they share in leading their countries. And so again, you know, I know it's, it's really interesting for people to focus on all of that, but uh, we have real work to do and we're doing it together as closely as any, any two governments I can think of. There are times, though, when it seems that even on the leadership level, there's a, a level of mistrust. Over the summer, when uh, the FAA stopped flights to Tel Aviv for a few days or a few hours, uh, it seemed to uh, the the resentment of that, the the perception that that was actually planned to to pressure Israel, came from Netanyahu himself. It didn't. Uh, it wasn't just rumors floating in the uh, in the stratosphere. I mean, what, how how could that? How could Net, how could Benjamin Netanyahu believe that? Uh, President Obama would pressure a, uh, an, an autonomous agency to, uh, to shut down flights. How, do, how, does it, how did it come to that? I can't speak for Prime Minister Netanyahu, but I do think that's a good example of the sort of thing that I'm talking about. First of all, it, I mean, working in the administration, I can assure you that uh, issue on airline security is not something the White House or any political person uh, directs. Uh, when the FAA has concerns based on their own procedures about flights, they advise airlines, and airlines do what you would expect them to do, which is to take every precaution to make sure that the people they're flying are, are, are safe. And we find that entirely reasonable uh, and appropriate. It is also true that the closure of an airport happens to be a highly sensitive matter within a country. Uh, and it can have implications for tourism, it can have implications for politics, it have implications for security. So it is no wonder or surprise that the people within that country would be very concerned uh, and want to do everything possible as quickly as possible to avoid it. So you know, that is a good example of the, the rough and tumble difficult challenges that we face, but it's also one in which, uh, in the end, you know, both governments did their jobs uh, the U.S. allowed its procedures to ensure that people flying on American Airlines were as safe as they should be, and the government of Israel did everything it could to make sure it wasn't getting reputational damage that it didn't deserve, and I believe within 24 or 48 hours the airport was open again. And by the way, we also did everything we could through uh, additional Iron Dome support uh, and other means but the hellfires were delayed. <laughs> uh, to ensure that Ben Gurion was safe so that people could fly uh, in and out. And uh, we made sure that Israel had everything it needed to defend itself because we were so strongly committed to uh, its right to do so. Okay, let's wrap up with, with ISIL. Uh, and uh, there's a report, I don't know if you want to confirm it, that the president wrote uh, 
uh, the, the uh, supreme leader and uh, and talked to, and, and and appeared to be linking the uh, a nuclear deal with cooperation on ISIL. Israel has great trepidation in terms of strengthening the uh, strengthening the hand of Iran, strengthening the hand of of, of, of Syria. Um, what do you tell the Israelis? How do you reassure them on that? Well, a couple of things. Uh, we don't talk about presidential correspondence, so I don't want to uh, address that. But I will be very clear, as I was before, that we don't cooperate uh, with Iran on this issue, that our nuclear negotiations with Iran are entirely separate. They're focused on preventing from Iran getting a nuclear weapon. They're not pr focused on expanding cooperation in the region or dealing with uh, other issues where we have other mechanisms to do so. But so you have we a don't. Shared goal in that area. I mean, doesn't involve that involve a degree of communication? But don't go to there because we're going to be bombing that area. Isn't that uh, the only uh, area in which that comes up? We obviously have direct uh, communications with the Iraqi government, uh, with which we're working very closely to deal with ISIL, including in a military way. And it is also true that. Uh, as has been widely reported, Iran has a presence uh, in Iraq, and so the Iraqi government can take it upon itself to ensure that there's no conflict that inadvertently emerges from there. But we've been very clear. Look, again, it's no secret that ISIL happens to be an enemy of Iran and of the United States. That doesn't mean that we're cooperating on ISIL or we're sharing or we're doing anything together. It's just an objective reality. Uh, and it doesn't lessen, just because Iran happens to be anti-ISIL doesn't mean that we're not anti-ISIL too, because we have great reason to, uh, to pursue the uh, degradation and ultimate defeat of that group. So we are going about our business in a systematic way, supporting the Iraqi uh, government and using our own military force, and we're making increasing progress. And I think you saw, even over the last week, uh, a number of U.S. airstrikes targeting leaders of that organization. Uh, and we believe that will contribute to setting it back. But, but no one should misunderstand. And again, I want to be clear because you know we started with Iran negotiations and we can end with it. Those are designed in our mutual interests, mutual U.S., Israel, the world, of stopping Iran from getting a uh, nuclear weapon. And we believe that uh, by focusing uniquely on that issue, we keep the international community together and we can achieve our common goals. We are not... Uh, we are very well aware of... Uh, Iran's damaging and destabilizing policies uh, in the region and its support for terrorism and its uh, domestic uh, uh, behaviors, all of which have been a problem and remain a problem and we will continue to deal with. Uh, but we do think it's in our common interest to have success in stopping Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks My for coming. My pleasure. Nice to talk to you.